everyone. Thank you for joining me today. Um, thank you to teachers, colleagues, um, students, alumni, and friends from actually around the world. Welcome to the teaching and le learning seminar on how to encourage student participation in online learning. I'm Queenie Lai, Associate Dean of Teaching and Learning, Chinese University of Hong Kong Faculty of Law. And um, it's really wonderful to see uh, longtime colleagues and alumni and friends on the registration list. So thank you for taking your time to um, join this seminar today. So unfortunately, the fifth wave of COVID has hit Hong Kong and we are back to online learning again after a very short window of face-to-face -face learning in term one. But learning must continue. Um, even in the most challenging of times and without any compromise on quality or student engagement. We as legal educators owe a duty to our students and to the legal community to give the best possible education and learning experience our students deserve. So I hope this seminar today is a timely initiative to discuss and reflect on some practical tips and strategies on how to motivate and engage learners in online learning. Special thanks to Dean Wolf and Professor, Professor Michael Lower and admin colleague Jaden for their support for this seminar and um, for their continuous dedication to teaching and learning matters at CUHK Law. Please may I encourage everyone um, to put in your comments or questions or ideas and feedback in the chat function, either privately to me or to everyone, uh, to all the participants. I'm sure all of you have a different experience with online learning. I would love to hear your feedback on this. So um, we, if we have time at the end, I would love to you know, hear your feedback on this. So today um, I'll be sharing some practical tips and strategies, largely mainly from my personal experience based on two and a half years of online teaching. I think it's really time for us to reflect and share what we've learned, what I've learned. I've consulted some research and literature, um, but largely it's based on my own personal practical experience. Um, and I'll be sharing some of my original class planning and designs with you all. The focus today is on strategies for online synchronous learning. So it's Zoom, live lectures and tutorials. Um, there won't be time today to discuss offline or asynchronous learning, Blackboard, community of inquiries, blended learning, hybrid learning, micro modules are beyond the scope of discussion today, as that would really require a separate session. But today I focus on engaging students online in live lectures. So today's session, um, it's four core themes today how to encourage student participation in online learning, motivating students, active learning, and creating a sense of community in online learning, expectation matters, and promoting interactivity in online tutorials and lectures. These are the concepts I want to explore with you all today, and I will illustrate with examples. The first three topics today to, uh, here, in fact, are to me, the keys to student engagement, whether online or offline. At the end of the day, if we want students to participate, these are the, to me, after I reflect on my own teaching for the past decade, you know, these are the keys to effective teaching and learning, whether online or offline. Um, motivation, active learning, sense of community and high expectations. Now, I just wanna share some teachers ask me, you know, when students don't participate or don't turn on their cameras in online learning, what should we do? I wanna talk about the carrot and stick approach. There is a stick approach where we tell them or make announcement and say, if you don't turn on your cameras, you'll be asked to leave the session. Or if you don't come fully prepared or participate in the tutorials, you'll be penalized or you, you won't do well in exams. I personally find it much more effective is the carrot approach, which is to motivate students, their intrinsic motivation, ignite their desire to learn, to have an interest in the subject, and to ensure that they understand that the participation is for their own benefit. So this is a much more inviting way to encourage student participation than the negative stick approach. Students learn because they want to, not because they have to. So how do we motivate students. 
these are the ways I motivate my students. And um, I want to share with you all today. So, explaining why participation is um, required, explaining my teaching philosophy early on in the course, explaining the relevance of the subject, and explaining the purpose of each classroom activity. Before we teach the how, students must know the why. I actually take a lot of time in my first introductory lecture and before every classroom activity to explain why participation is required. So I take the time. In fact, I share with them, you know, there are many webinars out there from law firms um, and you know, CPT courses out there. And sometimes I teach very similar topics to what law firm and CPT courses are doing out there. But I tell my students, there are two main differences between the webinars out there and my courses. Number one, I pitch at the entry level, I pitch at the level, which is the transition from law student to a lawyer. It's a layering approach. So I assume no prior knowledge and I lay out the foundation and build upon it step by step. And the other difference between webinars and my courses is that I've carefully designed active learning hands-on exercises that provides them with a deep learning experience as opposed to just surface learning. So that's why they must participate. That's why they need to interact with me, reflect and feedback that counts. This is how we help individual learners retain their knowledge. So I explained how, you know, why participation, particularly online participation is so important. Next, I explained my teaching philosophy very early on in the course. Teaching philosophies are not just for job applications or teaching award applications. I share it with my students that I'm teaching students not just for exams, but getting them ready, prepared for the real world of work. The reason I go into teaching is because I want to teach my students what I wish I learned before I enter into practice. At that time in those days, law school did not prepare me for my work. I was thrown to the deep end. Day one of my training contract at an international law firm, I walked into a data room. I have no idea what is due diligence, what is M&A, what is IPO. I have no idea what is a template or president. And I was thrown to the deep end. And I was you know, given ad hoc tasks. And I, don't, I can't picture the deal from start to finish. So law school then really did not teach me how to you know, do well at my job at the law firm. So I tell my students, I'm teaching you not just for exams, I'm teaching them what I wish I learned before I enter into practice. And I wish that they were more prepared than I was and have a head start and succeed in practice. And hopefully, you know, this would um, give them an intrinsic motivation to, to learn. I also explain the relevance of the subject. So how do I teach relevance? In my introductory lecture, um, I talk about um, the aims of my course, the learning outcomes. I want a clear roadmap for everyone uh, before we start. So I teach them the clear learning outcomes. I, talk, I go through with them the outline and the structure of my course so that they know clearly that I'm leading through them from a deal from start to finish at every stage of the deal. I would also talk about who would benefit from this course. Um, corporate lawyers to be, obviously, um, because my course is corporate finance. We talk, lead, teach them how to bring a company, advise clients to bring it to listing on Hong Kong Stock Exchange. So corporate work. It's also beneficial to anyone who wants to get involved in regulatory work, compliance work, or litigation in the future. Um, because, you know, if you're ever involved in market misconduct or commercial litigation, you have to know these as a background. So I, you know, it's an intrinsic motivation. I want them to understand who would benefit from, the, from this. And, la and of course, is commercial awareness. I, I spend a lot of time telling them, you know, it's not just about the rules. Law doesn't exist in a vacuum. Um, we need to put the rules into context. And we are dealing with corporate clients out there. You know, very often clients complain 
about the fact that lawyers give them stilted legalese that they don't understand. So I'm teaching my students that it's so important they understand the market trends, the context and the business language and understand the client goals. So this is commercial awareness. So I, I share with them all this from my practice. Now the relevance, how do I teach relevance? These are the ways I make them curious about my subject, interested in the subject and share, you know, I teach relevance and commercial awareness through these. So I use authentic materials as often as I can, I use authentic learning materials. It's not hypothetical or fictional scenarios that I make up. It's real IPO cases, real familiar household names, IPO prospectuses, Hong Kong stock exchange announcement that they will on a day to day basis use as a corporate lawyer um, at work. I would refer them to source materials. I online, I would show them the website exactly where to locate materials on the Hong Kong stock exchange website and SFC website. It's so important that my students learn to go to source materials because this is how it goes in practice. I tell them don't rely on my slides or my these are secondary notes. The, the rules and laws are updated on a daily basis, so you need to be independent learners to know where to find those materials. So this is how I share with them on online, you know, where to go for the materials. I use headline news, latest topical issues, you know, keep abreast with the news, the latest ESG, environmental, social and governance, SPACs, special purpose acquisition companies, single gender bots, biotech listings. I keep them abreast of latest, you know, January 2022, the latest news. So they know, you know, it's relevant to them, to their work, to their life. So they understand when they read financial news in the future. And um, policy issues behind, I always explain when I explain the rules, I also explain the policy reasons behind. They have to understand the historical context and how the rules evolves and the policy reasons behind it. So for example, in my course, through the Alibaba and end IPO rise and fall of Alibaba IPO case study, I discuss the reasons for you know, new chap listing rule chapters such as weighted voting rights and how securities regulators balance the protection of public shareholders interest against maintaining Hong Kong stock exchange competitiveness. So it's not just the rules, it's the policies behind this as well, and the historical and market trends, and how Hong Kong is positioning itself, you know, in the competitive market as an international capital markets these days. So I hope these, you know, it's not a law, not a lot of law in the introductory lecture. But as I've said, law doesn't exist in a vacuum, I hope they see the relevance to their subjects. So that is how I, you know, motivate them, explain the relevance. And then I would also um, explain the purpose of each classroom activity. Very often we assume students know why this classroom activity is meaningful to them. Um, but I remind myself to not have this assumption that I must explain to them the benefits of these classroom activities. So in, as you will see in a minute, I'll share with you my client pitch exercise and I tell them the benefits of learning from it, you know, the transferable skills, um, authentic learning experience, how you, you know, present to a client. So I'll, I'll share with you um, on this in a minute. But this in, you know, in relation to explaining purpose of each classroom activity, this leads to my second point on keys to student engagement. The way to engage students is to have hands on activity, active learning, as opposed to passive learning. It's learner centered. It's not teacher centered. It requires more than just listening, especially in front of a Zoom, you know, in the Zoom setting, you, you really want to get them involved you know, so that they're not just st staring at the screen and not absorbing. So it requires the active participation of each and every student. As you all know, students retain 50% of what they see and hear, but they retain 90% of what they do. The other point, and I add to that because it comes in with a package, active learning and teamwork and sense of community sense of community is so crucially important in an online learning context 
because the main difference between online and offline learning is the lack of face-to-face -face contact and the lack of social interaction before and after class. So students must feel that they belong to a community, a peer communities, communities of learners, and that will have a significant impact on their learning experience. So I will share with you uh, um, an original project, which um, I'm very proud of myself. It's my own project. Um, and I thought it worked really well in an online environment as well. This is active learning in online environment. It's a client pitch exercise. It's an example I want to share with you all. It worked very well, you know, face to face. But in an online context, it worked even better, I think. Um, I've designed this client pitch project to make what is uh, usually a very dry rule-based subject, you know, learning about listing rules uh, and the listing process of listing on Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Um, I designed this to make it fun and interesting and also to imitate real practice, okay, based on my own personal real experience. So what is a client pitch or beauty parade? So usually the majority of law firms work comes from referral or returning customers, but pitching um, it's a common method for law firms to secure new clients and new deals too. the pitching process. Um, it's often referred to as beauty parade and it in involves a number of invited law firms presenting to clients to potential clients in order to secure a deal. So this exercise that I carefully designed. It's an original design, um, exercise, which I designed, hopefully give my student a taste of corporate advisory work, corporate transactional work, and they understand what beauty parade is and what it takes to win new clients. In terms of substantive law, they understand the criteria for listing a company on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Now, I'm very, very grateful and fortunate to have the support of Professor Paul McHart, which is a, who is a lead, uh, leading legal education expert, and his kind comment on, on this original project. Um, and he is very kindly um, to invite me to share this project in London. This was pre before COVID times. I flew into London and I shared this project at a simulated client um, legal education conference organized by Society of Legal Scholars. So um, I think uh, I'm glad to have that platform to share this project. Feedback from students, the interactive simulated client pitch exercise was a remarkable experience in her corporate finance course, which gave us the chance to think from the client's perspective. And this is unique and valuable um, in PCLL. So this is this exercise um, worked really well, surprisingly well in online settings. It ensures that all my students are fully engaged, their cameras on, everyone's listening. The benefit of this exercise is also that every pitch is different. I, there's no sample answer. I have in total eight tutorial groups of 15 students each. Um, so you you need I need to design an exercise where don't they just don't have repeat the same answer you know for for the different groups every group comes with their own original judgment and insight and client advice and you know this is something I really appreciate I'm so touched when I see my students coming with their own original analysis and ideas and you know you can see the effort they put into to their slides. I'll show you more later. But you must remember this. This is only one tutorial out of six tutorials of the whole term. And it's not even summative assessment. The grades doesn't count. So, but they've produced such high quality work, you know, that, that means that they're really engaged. And I'm always, you know, so proud of my students who put in such efforts, even just for, for a summative or just a, just a, a, a tutorial exercise. So this is them talking about latest latest ESG topics. Um, I purposely asked them to present some topics that I've, I haven't taught in my class because um, at the end of the day, they have to be independent learners. And it's not just, um, they're not just, uh, they're the, they have to be producers of knowledge as well, not just the receiver. So they're, you know, ESG is latest, you know, this, 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 this year, these rules come about this year. And, you know, I, I, 
I encourage them to find out more and do the research. So um, this is what I share with them. You know, this simulated client, the, I share with them and explain, you know, the, the re rationale behind this exercise. It's important students understand the rationale behind your exercises. So active and deep learning. It's not just rote memorization. Um, it's deep learning as opposed to service learning. It's substantive law and skills-based training. Um, they're not just learning the listing rules. They are learning a lot of transferable client-facing skills. It's authentic, authentic learning materials. It's based on real company synopsis, real, real client advisory work. It's based on real companies that actually went on to IPOs in Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Um, it's contextual learning. I put rules into the context. And it's a, about developing professional identity. It's so important for them to think like a lawyer and understand the client's needs. And it's also about working on a range of um, client facing skills, commercial awareness, communication, presentation skills that are crucial to their success as future legal practitioners. You know, around the world these days, um, regulators want uh, centralized summative assessment, and the focus is always on test scores. But experience and research have repeatedly shown that it's through um, exercise, simulation, practice based training with feedback and reflection that really prepares our students work well ready for the real world of work. We are not training exam takers. These are the skills, you know, that train them with interpersonal capabilities. You know, think about all the ethics and core issues. Um, how do you meet client expectations? So these are what I want to bring in. It's not just the law, you know, it's all these transferable skills. So how does my exercise work? It's 15 students per tutorial. And um, I would divide 15 students into seven, student, st seven students uh, into two groups, law firm A and law firm B. Law firm A, it's a mining company that seeks to do IPO in Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Law firm B, um, it's a biotech company that wants to do IPO in the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. So why mining company and biotech companies? It's because these are the special chapters under Hong Kong Stock Exchange rules. Um, these mining and biotech, these are the companies that don't meet the profit or revenue requirements under chapter eight, the main board listing rules, because they are pre-profit, pre-revenue. It takes a long time for biotech to, after R&D, to come into commercialization. So these are the specialist chapters. So I want the students to understand the interrelation between main chapter eight, uh, main board listing requirements and the specialist chapters, why mining and biotech companies need to follow the special chapters. So in their respective groups, they have to prepare a 30 to 40 minute PowerPoint presentation with the aim of winning the company as the potential new client um, uh, and winning the deal. And it's advising, providing preliminary legal advice in relation to the client's plan to go listing in Hong Kong. Now, students would not just be reading off the listing rules, they would be envisaging themselves as legal practitioners and think of commercially practical solutions and how best to meet client expectations. The aim at the end of the day is to train our students to be effective corporate legal practitioners who are not just technically competent, but commercially aware, who can relate to clients and contextualize the advice. So this is the... Um, Client pitch beauty parade. Um, there are different ways to do it. I, simulated clients is I'm often the one who's role playing the the client. I'm the CEO of the client, and in some years I've involved actors as well. You know because I want the students to have a chance to practice interacting with clients. They have to answer questions on the spot, and um, it is I've t I tell my students it is much better that they practice in the safe classroom settings where they can practice and where mistakes are really less costly. Um, so I hope they appreciate the chance. When I tell them this, you know, I hope they appreciate the chance to practice all of this and motivate them, you know, to, to 
you know, appreciate these opportunities for continuous practice, reflections and feedback, which ultimately prepares them for the real world of work. Teamwork, the next point is teamwork and sense of community. Teamwork, so how do I get my students involved online? I have to create a sense of community. They have never met any of their teammates before the tutorials. So I made an announcement on Blackboard, meeting the teammates online. And I've said in lectures three, I will arrange for all of you to meet your respective teammates during break. The idea is for you to exchange your contacts in order to prepare for SGS tutorial one presentation. It's important that you attend lectures to meet your team members. And I also tell them the importance of understanding teamwork. You know, why is interpersonal skills so important? Corporate deals always involve teamwork, both internal and external. Divide and allocate responsibility amongst your teammates to ensure that everyone makes a contribution to the presentation, whether in terms of research, preparation, or presentation. This exercise aims to facilitate deep learning. Beyond acquiring substantive knowledge in relation to listing rules, it is designed for you to develop transferable skills asking insightful questions, analyze different possibilities, recommending sensible courses of action and solutions for your clients based on informed research and evaluation. Um, I want to give them ownership and autonomy. I want them to divide the work amongst themselves. Learners are much more motivated if you give them the autonomy instead of micromanage them. So, you know, the seven students, they can divide their responsibility. You know, they can, based on the topics they're interested in or the, the role they want to play, they can contribute the way they want to contribute. So I purposely give them the autonomy. Um, we must not forget you know, the need to develop students' interpersonal capabilities, practical learning skills, emotional intelligence, and ethical commitments. And I, you know, I, I these three years of online learning, I really feel out that students miss out a lot. You know, the peer community at PCLL, it's one of the, we always celebrate the diversity of, you know, the different backgrounds of our PCL students. Some are from our, our undergraduate LB students, some are from JD, some are from overseas, from UK, from Australia. I really want them to benefit from the peer interaction. Um, and it's what makes, our course, you know, exciting and, you know, long after graduation, it's all these PCL, you know, the connections that really counts long after graduation. So I create these opportunities for them, hopefully. Um, I break out rooms, I tell them in advance, you know, the uh, sort of the, the name, the groups they were assigned to. And in the breakout rooms, um, I ask admin colleagues to pre-assign students to the breakout rooms um, so that, you know, at the time when I want them to meet, I'll just open all the rooms and they're assigned to their different rooms with their teammates. And I ask, remind all of them to switch their cameras on uh, when they meet their teammates. So I think um, students appreciated the opportunity to mix and meet new friends, new peers, um, not usually the ones who sit next to them in lecture halls, but um, meeting new, new peers. Um, authentic learning materials. Uh, I repeatedly emphasize, I use authentic learning materials. These are company synopsis based on real IPO and case and transactions. As in real, the difference between authentic learning materials and fictional materials is that in real transactions, the synopsis cover a lot of information that is non-legal. In real practice, they won't separate legal and non-legal issues for you. It's not like, um, um, you know, the exam questions at, at law school where only relevant facts are given to you. Um, one key ability for a lawyer is to scan through materials quickly and discern what information is relevant and what is not and what information is missing. So they have to think from a lawyer's perspective, what are the areas that they, they need to focus on? I give them guidance on what to do in their client pitch. So these are some of the topics that they, they need to do in their client pitch, which is, you know, the, their law firm's perspective, 
uh, the clans profile, why list in Hong Kong, the various special listing rules, um, due diligence listing process. And I highlight what is in red. Um, as I've mentioned, they, these are new topics I haven't taught um, in my class yet, but I want them to find out. It's the latest topics out there, ESG, spec listing, weighted voting rights, even if I haven't taught them those topics, I want them to be independent learners and creators of knowledge. Um, so I want them to feel empowered that they can do, they can tackle any topics in the future. Law, I always tell my students, law constantly evolve. And we have to have the independent ability to do our own research and come up with our own independent analysis and judgment um, in you know, in light of clients' instructions. So this is what I um, always add new topics to, to the um, pitch exercise. I also give them tips on making a great pitch, um, planning, preparation, rehearsing, um, thinking about the strategy meticulously. It's so important. And it's about establishing your credibility and competence to their potential clients. And I always share with my students, at the end of the day, it's not about pass or fail. Um, when you go into work, it's not about pass or fail in your exams. And it's also not about what is in your head. It's about how you communicate with your clients, how you establish a trust, confidence and credibility and build your personal reputation in the long run, how, how your clients will trust you. Um, it's every small work matters, every small task matters. How fast you progress at work is entirely up to you. You know, if you are capable with a small task, people will delegate more with, to you and you will progress faster. So this is what I share with them. So I hope I give them the right mindset, uh, which is do their best at every small task. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's not about taking exams. It's the transferable skills and about, you know, building uh, your own personal reputation and also establishing trust with your clients. So let's take a look at some of my students' slides just um, this year. Uh, it, they, it's a, a, many, many more slides, but I've only selected some of it to share with you all. Um, you can see it's just one tutorial, but the effort they put in, you know, I'm so so proud of them. Um, so this is uh, their law firm expertise. Um, they share about the team members. You know, I think they really enjoy the role play. Um, the agenda for today's presentations, um, you know, a roadmap for the presentation, the project profile, why, why list in Hong Kong, you know, every presentation was different. Um, it's uh, the various analysis of whitelist in Hong Kong, listing of biotech companies and pre-revenue uh, biotech companies in Hong Kong. They've also discussed recent successful listing. So they understand the market out there. So it's important to know, you know, what are the recent successful deals, listing criterias, how the client on the right, how the client meets the financial requirements, listing requirements, um, it's important to apply the client situation in the case, special listing rules um, and recommendations to the client and latest rules on corporate governance and ESG listing timetable. And at the end, why hire the law firm? So I'm developing their legal professional identity so they think from the client's perspective and understand the role and and uh, you know of corporate advisory and transactional work so this is active learning um, it need not be you know a client presentation active learning it could be any of these it could be simulation and role plays client presentations client interviews client conference the goal is to enable the learner to have deep understanding of the matter so that they not just intellectually understand the materials, they're able to apply the materials and incorporate the materials into a larger worldview. Um, exceptional learning occurs 
in in professional legal education involves active engagement and the exercise of good judgment. So beyond acquiring substantive knowledge, they will develop different skills like asking questions, struggling with dilemmas, weighing possibilities, weighing consequences, and recommending sensible courses of action based on informed research and evaluation. So these kind of opportunities we create for our students that give them the chance of to meet with clients, simulated clients, have face-to-face -face interaction and go beyond the case book or the rule books. And now I will talk about the third element of keys to student engagement, which is high expectations. The final element. I think it's so important um, to set high expectations, high expectation in terms of student preparation, in terms of class participation, and in terms of student responsibility, professionalism, and identity. I convey my expectations early on in the course. I expect my students to turn on their cameras in, in tutorials, um, and they should come prepared and participate. And in the tutorials, I listen closely and observe. If, if I see students to be reading off their answers and not fully understanding their own answers, I would challenge them to make sure that they understand what they are saying. Um, this shows that I care. And over time, I think students know what to expect from my class. There are extensive literature out there that discuss students respond positively to teachers who set high expectations and demand much of them and challenge them. So I think it's one of the key elements to effective teaching and learning. It's really setting high expectations um, for preparation, participation and responsibility. Now, the last um, topic for today is promoting uh, interactivity in online tutorials and lectures. I want to give um, share specific tips and strategies for online tutorials and lectures. Um, in fact, there is actually a silver lining to online learning. Actually, everyone sits in the front row. You're never too far away from the speaker or or the screen. And like in the lecture hall where there are 100 students, you know, you have instant access to interact with the lecturer through the chat function. In fact, I find that some introverts or reserve, more reserved students are more willing to ask questions and interact through the chat function. So I encourage them to share any questions throughout my lectures or, or my, um, with my tutorials. So first on tutorials. Um, I don't, for tutorials, I don't permit black boxes in my tutorials. I ask them to turn on my cameras. I will announce this, you know, in my class. Over the years, I've only got one or two students who don't switch on their cameras. And if they don't, um, I would politely call on the student's name and ask them to turn it on. Over time, students will know what to expect for your classes um, if you are consistent with your request. So um, how can I know whether they are paying full attention, whether they're actively listening, whether they're fully engaged, if I can't see their facial expressions? I think it's so important for a teacher to be observant and perceptive with even the micro expressions, um, the body language and the, and the tone of voice. This is how you judge whether it's surface or deep understanding. These subtle cues, it's how I gauge their level of engagement. So it's so important that they switch it on. And I also, of course, have to show my interest when they are presenting. I show my interest um, through the video as well. So, you know, they must switch on their cameras during tutorials. Um, I encourage them to, um, if they think it's necessary, to blur or use virtual backgrounds if it makes them more comfortable turning on the cameras. Call on students. Um, I ask them to rename the, uh, the names uh, to the English name um, on Zoom every, at the start of every session. Auto, you know, when they join automatically, it's the full Chinese name, in Chinese um, translation name, but it's very hard to call them. So I will ask them to rename at the start of each class. 
And I would, at the every class, I would rotate and call on each student, usually about 15 students, uh, so that everyone should participate at least once um, in my tutorials before I do an open floor session. I want to make sure every individual feel welcomed and that their you know, voices are valued. So everyone should at least have a turn before I open the session. I don't want any one student to dominate the class. Um, and respectful environment. I think this is another key to effective teaching and learning online or offline. I, it's so important to create a respective environment, a safe, welcoming environment for students to share their thoughts, that they don't feel that they are being judged when they answer, they feel welcomed and include, included, and I treat my students as equals, as professionals, and I never make any of my students feel inferior. I respect my students, you know, by not tearing them uh, if they missed a point, and they also respect me by giving their undivided attention and come to class engaged and, and prepared. Um, growth mindset. To me, I think the magical words to encourage student participation is thanks for trying, you know, thanks for listening, or thanks for raising this question, thanks for your attempt. Even if their answer is wrong, I never embarrass any student um, you know, I, I would praise them just for attempting. The growth mindset means that talent and abilities are developed through effort and practice and learning from feedback and feedback and mistakes. So, you know, I just praise them. I encourage attempts. I encourage mistakes. And uh, learner-centered explanations. I won't take my student answers lightly. I won't just give a straight no, you know, without listening further. I would try to point out the individual misconceptions so that they really know that I'm truly actively listening uh, their answers. And on tutorials, I also teach writing and drafting um, commercial documents course, uh, which is about drafting contracts. So I thought, you know, online tutorials work very well. Um, in face-to-face, -face, I would be using visualizers. I would expect students to print their work and then I would show on the visualizer. But, you know, if students are sitting far at the back in the classroom, it's very hard for them to see uh, some of the, the work. So actually, online tutorials work quite well for writing and drafting contracts. Um, there are many ways to do it. Hand, how do they hand in their homework? Number one, I would ask them to submit work document through the file chat function. It's an excellent way of submitting homework instantly. So when I, I ask them to draft, you know, confidentiality agreements, letter of intent, sell and purchase agreement, I would ask them to submit their file to me. And then I would scan through the 15 work and then share one or two of them and work together on some of the clauses together. So I can also ask my students to share their work through the share screen function and give, let them be the moderator. Uh, some colleagues I know use Google Docs, which is they, you can co-edit and mark up clauses together at the same time. And one more tip to share, um, which is uh, in face-to-face -face, uh, tutorials, uh, there are sometimes in-class exercise where I would hand out the exercise to them, and I would expect to collect it back at the end. Um, I be, the reason being, I don't want them to circulate to the next group of students in the next tutorial class. So these are in-class exercises. Um, so how do I do that in an online in setting? What I do is I would set up a Google Docs link with that PDF document, and I would share that link in the Zoom in the class. Um, the link is for readers fewers for reading only fewers cannot download they cannot copy or they cannot print the document after the session i would delete the link so that you know it's only for them to use during that session and this is how i do you know in class exercise and replacing you know in class handouts so it's a document link that you can delete after class um and last two points on online lectures. Um, I've, you know, after tutorials, I want to talk about lectures. I mean, this uh, point, which is breaking lectures into segments and sections, applies online or offline. 
you know, we all know our attention span is only around 20 minutes before our attention starts to wane. And particularly with online lessons, it's so hard to sit there for three hours and focus. So how do we I do that? This is a sample of my three hour lecture rundown. Um, I would start off re recapping my last lecture, refreshing the memory, what they've learned last time. And then I would introduce and give them a roadmap of up what I'm going to do this lecture. So as a structured uh, roadmap for this clear learning outcomes. And I would usually have some videos or news or authentic learning materials uh, from news from Hong Kong Stock Exchange or from videos to share with them, hopefully to arouse their curiosity and interest in the topic. And then I would follow up with my uh, presentation about the rules. Then I would incorporate some interactive activity, whether it's handouts or multiple choice or case study, and put sometimes put them into breakout rooms. Other times I would invite them to uh, give their response in chat. So, you know, breaking up into small sections so that there's more interactivity. Um, and then sometimes I would follow with more presentations and more interactive activity. At the end, um, I would recap today's lecture, uh, revisit it, what I've done this this class, and I would always end with a Q&A live chat session. I would ask anyone who wants to stay behind the class, you know, please feel free to stay behind. And a lot of times, more than half would stay behind. I have uh, over 100 students for my corporate finance class. Um, and, you know, um, they, I think they appreciate the in online interactive live chats. So at the end, they would submit their chats and I would you know, live chat with them and answer any questions. You know, this is essential because now we don't have face to face. It's essential that they feel that they are supported and that the student, you know, teachers um, care about their, their questions and learning. What are the interactive exercise we can have um, as part of lectures? You know, we can have revision quiz. I can have case scenarios, A, B, C, different scenarios for them to come up with an answer. We have short questions, multiple choice. I particularly like summary charts. Um, you can see right here, there's a summary chart. Sometimes I would go through uh, different rules and then I would give them a summary chart and ask them to fill out that chart by themselves. Basically just summarizing what I've just covered. So it's a summary charts. And then um, we can use obviously breakout rooms for peer discussions. How do I invite their answers? They can either type out their answers through um, screen cap um, or file their answers or, or send in the chat and I would share their work online. So that brings us to the um, close to the end of the presentation. But before I end, I think there's nothing better to end my, my, my seminar than to show you a very short video clip of students engaging in online learning which really encapsulates all that I've been talking about, motivation, active learning, uh, high expectations and uh, community. So let's take a look at this short video. Around the globe, um, we are based in Hong Kong, but we truly have a global perspective. Um, I am Xenia today, and I'm glad to have with me today my team, Jacob, Patrick, Irene, Vince and Daniel. So. Today, we will briefly introduce you about our firm and our lawyers, our team, and then we'll give you some very general backgrounds about the IPO projects and why you should do it in Hong Kong. And then we will walk you through the different... Genova, already reaching a commercialization stage with Riders of Viva, getting incredibly close to that point. And then also with ASC 09 and 06, completing a number of trials and ASC 21, hopefully entering into trials within the coming years. We will revisit this later as having a core product past conceptualization is very important for certain listing requirements and having other products which are near there and have potential to reach there will satisfy certain qualms that the exchange may have uh, when accepting a biotech company to be listed in Hong Kong. And you will see this uh, this uh, table again coming. 
uh, this new specialist chapter called Chapter 18A under the listing rules, which Alva can really consider. And this is a new chapter that was introduced on the 30th of April 2018. And the reason why there was this new chapter was because the Hong Kong Exchange understood that there would be a lot of difficulties for biotech companies to really get the capital for R&D first. And they couldn't get the capital before they even commercialize their products. And indeed, if Alpha can satisfy the requirements under Chapter 18A, then it can really list as a biotech issuer under it. It. And the main reason and the main purpose of uh, having Chapter 18A here is actually to permit listings of all the pre-revenue biotech issuers that do not meet any of the main board financial eligibility requirements, as Danny just discussed. So um, I will now walk you through some of the backgrounds as well as some of the requirements of Chapter 18A. Now on to the next slide. We can see that according to the report from Frost and Sullivan, there have already been 48 deals completed under Chapter 18A, having raised more than 110 billion Hong Kong dollars. And as you can see, um, although the chapter, the new chapter has been- So now we know that we think that Alpha should list on Chapter 18A. So it's now my turn to tell you why you should choose to list with, to partner with us, Lion and Co. We have over 20 years of providing legal services for Hong Kong and PRC related IPO transactions. We have an extensive track records in IPO, and we also have extensive experience in Chinese companies. I think one of our major advantage is that all of our lawyers are here at the concerns at every stage of an IPO process. We are well catered to serve our needs, the needs of our clients throughout the whole process. On top of that, we also have a great reputation in the field and a good track record. In 2021 alone, we have worked on 15 IPO deals. And throughout our years of practice, we have also completed 10 chapter 18A IPO deals. We were luckily enough to rank tier one in our Okay, um, so it's, it's just some excerpts. I wish I can share with you more because there are many, many wonderful parts and every single pitch is different. So I hope that, you know, from this um, sharing, you can see um, my students are engaged. Um, I, I think they enjoy it. I, I, I can see from them that they enjoy the role play. Um, it's high quality work. You know, it's just one tutorial session. It's not, you know, exam. It's not, uh, the, the, the scores doesn't count. Um, and they're developing their professional identity, thinking from the client's perspective. It's also commercial awareness and understanding market trends. Um, and it's deep learning because they're putting listing rules into context and not just applying. Uh, they're just they're advising their clients and applying their knowledge. So um, and it's only the first tutorials before I even begin the whole transaction from moving on to due diligence and listing, et cetera. So this is the first tutorial. So um, this is some uh, ways for me to share around the globe. Sorry. Um, we are moving on to the next slide, which is the final slide, um, which is what we've discussed today. So. Uh, hopefully um uh thank you everyone for you know um this session hopefully these are some ways to encourage student participation in online learning we've only got about um very short time left for my seminar um so i invite you if you want to uh, have any comments for me please um write your comments in the chat function i will read some of the um chat questions uh, which i've received H hello um professor jane chang i'm uh, jane chang from nottingham law school i'm so glad you're joining us off the way from uk and that you remember me um since my visit uh, to nottingham thank you so much for joining today really really glad to see you on uh, here today um there is another question which is um do you uh from um Hesso, uh, Lobo, do you offer credit for participation? We are considering this here, but wonder what others have found um, if they do this. Um, credit for participation. Yeah, good question. Uh, for this session, this credit, uh, this client pitch exercise, uh, it's there's no credit because it's just one out of six tutorials. Um, it's 
it's just part of the exercise. It doesn't count towards the exam scores. But what I've, you know, I'm really touched is that our students put in so much effort, even though um, it doesn't count towards their scores. Um, so I, it's the intrinsic motivation. What do they get? They get praises from me at the end. So <laughs> I hope that, uh, and also they feel empowered because once they have done it, they feel that, you know, they are capable of doing the client pitch. So it's about intrinsic motivation, but it's a very good question you raised because on another occasion, if it's another course, if it's something I can do for my, you know, LLB or LLM or JD electives, I would, you know, give, I would, you know, perhaps as um, part of the um, evaluation process, student presentations can count towards the score, certainly, you know, part of the uh, score. So I think it depends on your, your course. Um, so thank you for the question. Um, one question, um, how can one apply your wonderful strategy, say for a module like criminal law from Augustine? Uh, thank you, an excellent question. I'm not a criminal law expert myself. There are other experts, uh, my colleagues out there, but criminal law, I understand uh, my colleagues would do trial advocacy, uh, conference skills, um, and um, all these other ways, uh, also um, client interviews, um, you know, simulated clients, we always do a lot of work on client interviews. So, so these are other ways, basically simulation and role play in, in context. Um, so thank you for your question, but uh, I think it requires a criminal expert to ex answer that. Um, and uh, thank you so much for your, everyone's kind, kind thought. Uh, um, Jane, it's a pleasure and much food for thought in your seminar. And um, how? thank you so much, Queenie, for your excellent sharing. Re really learned a lot from your informative presentation. Thank you. Um, another question is, uh, let's take a look. I th it, it's from uh, Shmo um, and how do we encourage student participation in educational process and in university life generally, and particularly when we are transforming to Zoom and uh, remote learning and to increase support um, participation for students? That is an excellent question, and I wish I have more time to discuss on that. I really, really think, you know, after two and a half years of, you know, remote learning, and online learning, there's so much we should do to support our students, particularly, you know, positive well-being. Um, they are, uh, this year is already better because um, the first term they were face to face and at least they have met some of their students. There were two years where it was completely online and remote learning. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, we really need to have more active learning exercise and building a community. Uh, of support, you know, that you're always ready to answer your students' question and um, um, offline, you know, I always have Zoom meetings with my, my students offline these days. They have, many of them approach me, you know, we connect through LinkedIn, we connect through Facebook, we connect through uh, all these ways. And um, if they want career advice, I'm always happy to chat. So I think um, it's just being there you know, and also creating these communities, activities where they can meet each other. I know that some of my group members over time, they would form their own WhatsApp group to, to um, support each other. And that is so important. Perhaps I should remind them to do so. Yes, that's a, a very, thank you for your question. Um, I think I will uh, have a few more minutes left. Let's take a look. Um, uh, thank you, James, who is one of my students. I'm glad that I have the luxury as a student to attend your classes and witness your passion in teaching. Just a quick question during student presentation. How can students get instant nonverbal feedback from teacher? Nonverbal feedback. I think it's feedback, right? Um, nonverbal feedback. Um, during student presentation, uh, uh, well, just for my client pitch exercise, um, I, I often you know, um, uh, join in and give uh, questions uh, as a client throughout the client pre presentation, uh, because I, I do want to have some interaction. Um, I save my comments at the end of the presentation because I don't want to 
you know, I, I am still role playing at the client as the client during the presentation, but at the end, I'll give you my feedback. Um, uh, so I hope that answers your question. And um, is there anything else? Um, Emma, thank you, Emma Flint. Um, thank you for your question. If you do grade and assess it, would you share past examples of student presentations with the current cohort as exemplars? You could then do marking exercise with the students to help them understand how they would be marked. Oh, that is an excellent point, excellent question. Thank you. I think um, this may be the last question I'll take today, but thank you uh, for that. Um, in my tutorial, in my class, I do share some slides from past um, presentations from past years um, as examples. But, I, um, but in terms of marking, because my course is not graded, so I, 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 I didn't go into too much uh, detail into that. But I know having joined the simulated client workshop um, in London, Society of Legal Scholars and talking with Professor Paul and also um, my colleagues at Hong Kong U, um, they do a lot of work on simulated clients, cl particularly with client interviews. And they really use it as client interviews, as, uh, as a, uh, a, a, a summative assessment, they really mark them. So I think in those, on those occasions, they should give them marking criteria and examples of past presentations or interviews to show them how it works. So I think it depends whether it's graded or not. But with that, I think that is the last question. I'm so glad to see all of your comments and thank you for all your support, you know, particularly with colleagues all the, around the world and my students and alumni as well, you know, really wonderful to see you all. So thank you, take care and stay safe in the COVID times. Thank you everyone. Mm -hmm.